Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Giri Murphy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. We are in a small comedy club around the corner from Channel 4 News today because my guest on this week's show is an emerging star. She's become really famous on Twitter, largely through lockdown, um, as a Conservative MP and right-wing activist who many people mistake for really being a Conservative MP or right-wing activist. Um, but she is, in fact, Rosie Holt. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Now, look, you, you've, so you've become huge over the last couple of years, suddenly, and yeah. kind of unexpectedly, I would imagine. Yeah. Because, really, you're an actor. Yes. Yeah. So how did this happen? Well, lockdown happened, really. So before that, I was about to go on tour. I was about to go do a six-month tour in America of a comedy show called The Crown Jewel, which was a parody of Netflix, The Crown, and it was me and one other actor playing all the parts. And then lockdown happened, so that, that put a stop to that. And then, like everyone, I was at home, kind of frustrated and not doing anything. And it was during lockdown run, it was the, the Black Lives Matter protests, and. Sadiq Khan had posted that they were taking down a statue of Robert Milligan and there was a lot of very angry comments saying, oh, you're ruining democracy, you're erasing history. And I was reading this and I was sort of um, both kind of amused and slightly uh, surprised about how, um, how angry people were about this. And the next day I put up a video pretending to be a woman who was saying, um, these statues being taken down is terrible, they're erasing history just like Stalin did, who incidentally I have a statue of in my garden. And uh, it went viral and people thought it was real and told me to take my statue of Stalin out of my front garden. And how did it go viral? Because you yeah. know, there will be people, creatives, all the time who are trying to think, who are trying to make something yeah. go viral like that. So did you have any followers? Did you have any big followers? I had about 3,000 followers. And I had a few big, big followers, not, not very many, but a few just because, you know, I work in comedy and acting, so of course you, you meet people, but... And is that what happened? Did you have big people who gave it a kick and then it, and then it I had off, I had a few comics I knew, yeah, who'd sort of liked it and gave it a kick. But it was crazy because I'd posted the odd video up before and it, 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 nothing had happened. And then this one, it just went, it went crazy. And then it kind of snowballed from there, really. Because you're editing in real interviews yes. with your Yes. So, so what yeah. I started doing, yeah, was being a Tory MP and I'd splice myself in existing footage of interviews in on Good Morning Britain or, or whatever MP had been wheeled out that morning to defend something the government had done. And then I'd, I'd put myself in the footage and in its place. And because you were unknown at yes. that stage, some people, as they do, thought they were real. Yes, yes, <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> Which does happen on Twitter, but you did, you did also kind of look at them thinking, how did you think that was real? I know, I know, it was extraordinary. Also, I found the, the more um, outrageous things my character said, the more people would think it was real. So how much of this is your expression of your own fury, politics, yeah. feelings, whatever? I think a lot of it is. I think, um, especially with the MP character, I think it was a mixture of amusement and fury. I think amusement that we were seeing these MPs being wheeled out and it was like they, they had to improvise. It was an improv game that someone had gone, quick, defend why we're not feeding uh, starving kids, go. And they were having to improv really quickly without any, any idea of how they actually felt or, or, or what the reasoning was. But fury, I think, because I think like a lot of people, I felt that... Um, we were being taken, taken for fools, really, as the British public. Especially, especially with the Sue Gray report. I did a sketch on that, and that went, that went very big. Because um, you had these people going out going, oh, I can't possibly say whether I was at the party until I read Sue Gray's report. And it was so ridiculous. And the idea that we should, we should believe anything they were saying, I thought was quite extraordinary. And I, I particularly... Uh, became aware of that in, in lockdown. I mean, with, with Dominic Cummings especially, where you had all these ministers kind of saying about, very earnestly about how he was, a, he was a good father and he did what any good father would have done. And it was making a mockery of all these people who'd made huge sacrifices and hadn't visited relatives who were dying or much worse. And then we were supposed to believe that he was driving to Barnard Castle to test his eyesight. So, yes, I think there was a, a lot of uh, anger there. And then I, I've always liked 
laughing at things that make me angry anyway. Have you had much backlash from the people you're taking off? I haven't, not from, not from Tory MPs. I mean, there are certainly a lot of people who really hate me on the internet. And, and, and actually, interestingly, they seem to be from all ends of the political spectrum. Oh, really? Yeah. Why? Because there are some who think you're I think there's, there's, a posh white girl and some who think yeah, you're... Yeah. You know, I've got a lot of anger from people on the far left who think I'm not left enough. I don't know. I don't really understand it. And I think... Um, but I, I think we're always trying to... Especially now, because we're so tribal um, in the current climate, that people are always trying to... I don't know, put you in a box and, and define who you are. You know, I made a joke about it in my show that I did in, in, uh, in Edinburgh, that I've been, I've been called a, a centrist melt, a right-wing authoritarian, a lefty loon. I've had all the labels thrown at me because someone's always trying, if you don't quite fit in with the view that they, they want of you, they go, oh, well, you must, be, you must be this, you must be opposite to me. How do you respond when yeah. people, as I'm sure they do, just kind of accuse you of being part of the sort of lefty, snowflake, woke... Yeah. Problem. I find it quite funny. I think um, because both 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 ends of the political spectrum do it right. We we will throw labels at the other, um, but it's it's a way of uh, it's a way of shutting down the argument, isn't it? I did a sketch where I was taking the Mickey out of this this interview on talk radio, and. Um, and they were they were basically talking about statues, and they were going they were going it's, it was just a different time it was a different time, and uh, why are we judging people with with the standards of today? So I riffed off that and was going, you know, we used to we were burning witches. It was a different time. It was a different time, and beating up your wives. It was a different time, and they um, the the interviewer in question responded quite angrily and saying that I was a a, a wokey. <laughs> Working loser or something like that. But do you find woke itself? I yeah. mean, people are really ambivalent about woke, aren't yes. they? You know, yes. They've, they've gone from saying, "Well, if woke is anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-discrimination, call me woke." You yeah. Know, to then being a, to now, it's as though the the attack on woke has been quite effective, so that people have backed yes, you're, away from you're right, yeah. wanting to be woke. They say, "Well, I'm not really woke." Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's become like the label feminism used to be. Yeah. People go, oh, well, no, I'm not a, I'm not a feminist. So how do you feel about being woke? Are you woke? It, it depends who you're talking to, doesn't it? Because I think, yeah, inherently, woke should be a really, really great thing. And I think it is a good thing, but it's become conflated with this idea, this rather sort of punishing idea on, on, on the left of, well, peop, a lot of people see woke people as uh, um, as as overly critical and unforgiving. And no platforming and cancel yeah, culture no platforming and all of that. Yeah, no cancel culture. So it, it is one of those words now which has become to mean several different things. Certainly when I'm called woke, um, I think what's extraordinary is it's not... They're not saying it because I've, I've advocated that we cancel someone. So they're, they're, they're taking that word that, that encapsulates all of those things and throwing it at me as a way really to to cancel anything I'm saying and to, to make it null and void because they're saying, well, this, this person, this person deflapped up from people, this person, this person, and that and that. So it's, it's, an un, it's become a very unhelpful label, but certainly if someone throws it at you, why, why are they throwing it at you? Are they throwing it at you because you've, you've said that we should take these, you know, to ban these novelists or whatever, or are they saying it because you've said something they don't like or makes them feel defensive about our culture or, or, or the British Empire. So it's really why are people throwing those labels at you. And how do you feel about no platforming and cancel culture? Is, I, that, is that an own goal by the left or...? I think it's so complicated. I, I have really mixed feelings towards it because um, I'm not sure it's as simple as saying it's accountability culture. There there, it, it's certainly the case that the problem is is sometimes people will talk about certain people being cancelled, certain large figures who who aren't, who are doing just fine. You know, J.K. Rowling, she her career is, is is still fine. She gets a lot of abuse, but there is certainly, I think, um, quite an unforgiving nature of certain aspects of the left, which I can see why people feel inhibited by and worried by. It's when people say there's no cancel culture, I kind of go... And you're, well, you're a bit nervous even saying that, yeah. really, aren't you? Because you're worried about that. Yeah, definitely. Yes. And, and also because I've seen when, when people have um, discussions online 
And if they don't articulate themselves quite right, they, they really feel the full fury of one side or the other. Yeah, I do, I do think we've become quite unforgiving on the left. And, and I think that's worrying. But on the, on the, on the other hand, I think, I think it's good that we are now addressing certain thoughts and language that we thought was fine. And, and, and that, that, shows, that shows a growth of society and thought which is good. So, yeah, I've, I've really mixed feelings about it. Are your politics straightforwardly sort of um, middle class, centre left? Yeah. Or, um, or, or something else? Obviously, some of my politics becomes very clear in my work. But I don't really want people to read my work as me pushing a particular political agenda. I'm very much criticising the government, I think that's clear. But I don't really want to be moving from a place of, I think we should vote for this person or, or go with this party. I wouldn't say I'm party political. I mean, I, I think I have become more political really since, like a lot of people, since Brexit. I think that's when it became clear to a lot of people that, I don't know, the country was really changing. And people were so angry with each other. Um, and then especially, yeah, the last few years, the, the government, I government make me really angry. I think they're dreadful. And do you think what you do pricks the bubble of that anger or does it feed it? I hope really it's a, a release. I mean I always do it because it's cathartic for me. I mean and I obviously want to put things out there I'm not doing but it, it, I, I find it cathartic for me and I hope it's cathartic for other people. But then I think also I do want to draw attention to the fact that um, the government's ridiculous. And I think we should laugh at this government. I think that's really important. I think it's quite an important tool that we have, especially in Britain, to, to laugh at our politicians. A lot of countries aren't able to do that. Um, and I think we should make full use of it. And what, what do you think of the idea that politics has gone beyond satire? I don't agree with that. You don't agree with that? No. Right. I think, I mean, otherwise I wouldn't have done as well as I have in the last year or so. I think at the moment, um, the government's really ripe for satire. And uh, there, there are certain characters in politics where you go, no, that I can't satirise that person. They're like a cartoon character. Like? Donald Trump or Nadine Dorries, sort of people like that who are so extraordinary and out there and the things they say. You go, well, I could do a, a video mimicking this, but I can't add anything to it because it, it's all out there on the page. If they didn't exist, you'd think I was making them up. What is it about this phase in politics yeah. that makes it so ripe for satire? I think it's a few things. What I felt with Boris Johnson's um, government was that he'd, he'd kind of got rid of all the competent uh, conservatives and instead in his place he'd sort of put people who were, who were loyal uh, rather than competent. And I think that's why we went through this sort of extraordinary phase. And then, of course, we were hit by the coronavirus, which was extraordinary. So we were in this extraordinary time with this government who were frankly not up to the job so so suddenly it was a real sense of we weren't um <laughs> we weren't a sensible country anymore political satire in this country i think has has, has generally ridiculed um the center yes so if you look at uh, you know television yeah you know satire it's basically picked on slightly useless centrist conservative and labor politicians yeah. or liberals um and made fun of them as sort of a bit, bit ridiculous and a bit useless. You could run an argument that says it's sort of satire's fault that we've got where we are. Um, in that, in the, you know, has, has satire ridiculed mainstream politics yeah. and pushed us to the, pu pushed us to the edges the extremes. of the extremes? No, what do I do don't believe that, that at argument? all. What the because it turned out that the extremes were less desirable. Satire is the problem. Well, not yeah. that satire is the problem, but, but that satire ran with a mainstream political narrative yes. that normal politics wasn't working. Yes. That these people who we elect year in, year out from the same kind of pool of people, whether they're Labour or Conservative, they're essentially the same. Yeah. Was the sort of, you know, the, the, the thesis. Yeah. And that actually that, that has played into an idea that people actually want something different, whether it's, whether it's left or right. No, I because by that... And we've ended that, up experimenting with that in recent years. Yeah, I mean, by that argument, though, you could say any criticism of the, of the government is, is going to put people off the current, current system. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, thinking things like the thick of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, well, they're I, sort of nice but useless Yeah, ministers. nice but useless. Yeah. Um, 
but I think there's, there's pro probably a quite a strong grain of truth in that that should be explored and should be pointed out. Mm -hmm. And I think what's driven us sort of, because you're right, we are so much more divided. Uh, but I think, I think that's more to do with things like Brexit and popping up of certain, um, certain, certain channels that are either very right wing or very left wing and this kind of intolerance of thought and intolerance of the other side. And that's, uh, that's really, I think, what's, what's caused us to be so divided. So, so why don't people satirise the Nigel Farages yeah. of this world? Is what, is yeah, because yeah, they should. I think they, I mean, I Is said, it because they're not funny? I think it's, it's trickier. I think some of the, I, I mean, I've certainly tried to, and certainly with, with some of my earlier sketches, I, I try and satirise that, that very kind of right-wing strain. I mean, going back to things like the use of the centrist, there is almost a, um, you can still sort of empathise. The, the thick of it works because also you sort of empathise with people not knowing what was going on and trying their best. Whereas um, it's hard to empathise with Nigel Farage, I think. I mean, I did do a sketch actually about one of his sort of migrant, his ideas about migrants, and they are um, horrific. And I think you can satirise them, you just have to be a bit more careful because it's, it's upsetting. I don't know, it's interesting because at the moment, a lot of the satire we're seeing is online because things move so quickly. And, and on, in TV, we don't seem to have it at the moment in the same way. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so, so do you think comedy is more advanced online? I think, I think in terms of politics, it can just, because, because politics has been moving so quickly. Uh, By the time you make a TV show, it's, it's moving, yeah, it's, it's gone. Yeah, it's, it's your two days out of date, which can seem a long time at the moment. And is there a whole breed of comedians online that TV hasn't touched? Yeah, hasn't I think so. I think there's a few people who've really done well out of, of the last few years. People like Michael Spicer and... Um, Alistair Green, Exploding Heads, and uh, um, they've, they've certainly done very well, and I think that's because the thing about online comedy is you can react so quickly. Something can happen in the morning, and you can write something in the afternoon, edit it, and put it out by the, the next morning, or even on the same day. And can you make a living from that? Not really, <laughs> no. No, you can, make a, you can certainly make a bit of money uh, online. Um, but really, it's from other avenues, which is why, really, I think TV needs to, to work out how to, how to utilise satire and put it back on TV. Just explain that. In America, obviously, you've got all these late-night shows that, uh, that are really quick off the mark and satirising certain things. We don't really have that. We have certain things like The Mash Report, but then that went to Dave. And I feel there's a real dearth of, of satire um, on TV, and I think there's a real hunger for it. Do, do you think we've got the, the, the talent here? I mean, I've talked to a lot of TV executives about this. Yeah. About the, what, why is it that America can have these daily, more than one as well, yeah. daily late night comedy shows where they have a routine and a sketch that is, that is instantly reactive? Yeah. Um, and the answer is usually because they have a room of writers for each of those shows and all of those writers are really good. Yeah. And if you try and create a writer's room in Britain, there aren't enough. Yeah. Any, any fairness in that? I don't think that's true. I mean, there's some really, really brilliant comedians uh, on the, on the, not just online, but on the circuit. I mean, the fact that you can, you do have all this, this wealth of comedy online and some of, it, some of it's bad, but some of it is very, very good. And that's someone writing very quickly under, you know, very short time frame. So there's no reason to me why that can't translate to TV. And in terms of the ambitions of people in your position, yeah. Is TV any kind of holy grail? Do you want to be on TV or do you like the freedom of just making your own content? I love the freedom of making my own content, but yes, I do, I do want to be on TV. I think, I think we all want to be, we all want to be on TV if you're a, if you're a comedian or a performer. Because, because what? Because TV is more culturally influential or what? Yes, definitely. And I th think just the longevity and, um, I mean, what's extraordinary is it used to be about the reach. You go, well, I can reach so many people on TV, where now actually you can weirdly reach more people online. I don't know, I think there's a real space for satire on TV, and I hope that happens. Do you worry about what might happen if Labour take over in two years' time? Yes, a little bit. <laughs> um, 
the, the good thing about... So is there just a two-year window, basically? Yeah, two-year window kind of for my career. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll reinvent myself again as a mime artist. Um, I think, certainly in terms of with, with my MP characters, I feel that she could really be part of any party. She's just parroting the government line. Yeah. And because that message discipline came from New Labour. Yes. Originally. Yeah. So I suspect that she could, she could quite e easily transfer to the other side. But there is, um, yeah, it does make me wonder, because I think especially at the moment there is a particular anger for this government, which, although um, isn't great for the world, is quite good for comedy because there is an appetite for it. Yeah. And I wonder whether that appetite will be there if we have a, a Labour government. Because we've been through this before, I mean, yeah. in 97, where we saw a lot of political comedy drop off and we saw the demise of things like Spitting Image yeah. and, uh, and those sorts of satires, partly because people thought, oh, well, we've, we've done, you know, we can't do this about Labour now. Yes. Um, so there, there was a challenge if Labour were to win the next election to yeah. make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. Really, we just need the Tories to stay in power <laughs> <laughs> for the sake of my career in comedy. What, what do you think we need to be thinking about in terms of making that transition, in terms of making sure that all of this doesn't just die a death? Um, I think because if you're telling a bigger truth than just sort of reacting to this government, yeah. it's quite important yeah. that that carries on. Yes, definitely. I think... Well, I think also if, it, if it's essentially uh, what we're looking at, or what I'm looking at, is the fact that government officials are not necessarily honest and they're coming in front of, of the public and they are saying things um, to defend the party line when actually the reason why they're supposed to be talking to the public is to be explaining to us what is going on and what they're doing to make things better. And if we're feeling that that line is somehow broken, I don't necessarily know if that would change with a, with a Labour government. I mean, it's clear that their approach is going to be precisely to tackle that. Yeah. Because they're talking about getting rid of the House of Lords, big reform yeah. to, uh, you know, to, to political integrity and all yeah. of that kind of stuff. So they're going to try and tackle that. And the, and the question is, does that make it not funny? And we've already seen that, I mean, Rishi Sunak, when, he, when he, his first thing was to say that he was bringing integrity back. Yes. And so far, he hasn't really, <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't really uh, proven. So I think... Um, good, good, you know, if Labour get in power, good luck to them if they're bringing back integrity, and I hope they do. But I'm sure there'll be a lot to play with. I think even however well-intentioned a, a government is, you still have to hold a mirror up. You still have to say, they may be, they may be trying, but this is what they're doing wrong. I think that's very important. Well, sometimes the, the anger with this current government is I feel, are, are you trying and do you care? And I'm not sure they do. We, we talked a little bit about sort of making the move from social media to TV. Yeah. Uh, to what extent is the perilous state of Twitter yeah. a worry for you at the moment, given that that's where you've made your name? Yeah, completely. No, it is, it is a worry. The, the, yeah, the reign of Elon Musk is not looking, it's not looking great for Twitter at the moment. And is that mainly because that's where your following is? That yeah. You're about? yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm already, you know, I'm going on tour in, in the new year um, with, well, with a show I, I did in August, which is already completely out of date, so I'm having to rewrite it all. But, so I hope that, um, because I, do, I don't want my career to be just restricted to Twitter. I think Twitter is great in lots of ways. As I was saying, just because of the speed you can put something out, but I, I don't want that to just be my career. So, Hopefully, there's enough avenues opening up that if Twitter does go down in flames, I'll be fine. But I, I hope it doesn't. But it, it is a worry. I feel... Um, I mean, you might be the last generation who get out of it, mightn't you? Yeah. And sort yeah. of make the move onto stage and TV and other... Yeah, completely. And other media. And I think that'd be sad because there's no other social media platform like it, really. Do you know people who are giving up on it? A yes, a few people have kind of contacted and say, oh, I'm leaving the platform. Um... And then I've certainly lost a lot of followers in the last two weeks. But in terms of your own career, sort of, you, you say you're, going, you're on tour now. Yeah. Um, is that a process of sort of growing up in comedy? Well, I, did, I did the Edinburgh Festival this year, and it was wonderful because I'd, I'd sold out my run before I got there. And I've, I've done the festival a few times, and usually it's a real struggle getting six people in the audience. So that was uh, incredible and really lucky, and I'm hoping that, that yeah, I can capitalise that and... Um, and people come and see it. So yes, it does feel like the next step, but it's certainly a very nice position to be in, to suddenly 
not have to worry about an audience. And often, because as a comedian, when you come on stage, uh, particularly as a female co comic, um, if people don't know who you are, the first two minutes on stage is really trying to convince people that you're funny. And you have to do that more as a woman. Because people... Do you? Yes, I think so. I, th I still think that's the case. I think you go on stage and... If a man goes on stage, people are more relaxed. They think, okay, this man's going to make us laugh. Where if a woman comes on stage, people tense up a bit and they're, they're a bit distrustful. So I, I find as a woman, you, th those first two minutes on stage, you have to work a lot harder. But I found that much less since I've been performing on stage and I've got a name to myself because people already like my work, so they're already relaxed. Do you think that's just the men in the audience or the women as well? No, it's the women as well. Yeah, I've had... Every, every female comic will tell you this, that we've all had women come up and going, I don't usually find women funny, but I, I've, I thought oh you, were, <laughs> you were funny. And you go, oh, what, what other female comics have you seen? And they go, um, I, n n none. So how do you address that? I mean, what do you do to then be extra funny in the first two minutes? It's really irritating. I think sometimes what I used to do is I, I used to address it early on that I was... I can't even remember what I said, but it was a very funny joke. <laughs> Sometimes I think the, the best thing to do any time when, when, you, when you're doing comedy is to... It's why you know, a lot of comedians will go up and they'll address something about their appearance, which is instantly recognisable. I think it's addressing what, peop what, what people are thinking in the audience. So I think sometimes if you can address that straight away, that's the way to do it. But it's, it's changing and there are so many more uh, female comics now. Why do you think comedy audiences are sceptical about women? I think it's just traditionally people have always seen men as being funny and, um, and that's definitely changing but also it, it's lots of things. I think um, a lot of TV formats, formats are geared towards um, funny men in a way that they aren't towards women. But so, so there's a structural reason? Yeah, I think there is a structural reason but I think, I think also it's just, for me, when I was... Um, I remember thinking this at uni, I, I, I was always a lot more afraid to make jokes socially than, say, a man was. And I knew I was funny. And it took me a long time to be funny in the way I wanted to be funny. So I used to make people laugh at school by, um, by being a dip, bit ditzy or playing up to that, that kind of role. And I think a lot of women, less so now, but I think a lot of women used to do that because you, you, you want to make people laugh. And that's the way you do it. And if you're going to make a joke about politics in a, in a large space, you're not going to get the reaction that you, you perhaps want to. I think there is an inherent um, lack of confidence being, being a woman and being funny that you have to overcome a bit. Or certainly that was my experience. And so how does that change? I think it's already changing. I mean, I, I, um, even, just even in the last 10 years, there's so many more women trying comedy. And younger women, when I started... Um, I didn't start doing stand-up until I was in my early 30s. And a lot of women who were trying stand-up, it, it, they were similar sort of age. It was almost like we'd had to go through our 20s working out whether we were funny or working out whether we could be brave enough to be funny. Whereas now, there's a lot of young women on the circuit who are, who are sort of 18 and 19, and I don't think... That was, I don't think that was the case 20 years ago. But do you, do you have to work within the same... I mean, if you think, think about the structural reasons yes. for that, does that mean that your pinnacle still has to be doing the Apollo? Yeah, it's interesting because I think certain things... Um, panel shows, I think, are inherently quite male. Just the way of... Um, there's... Aggressive sounds mean, but there is this sort of out-joking each other... Um, which isn't really how women, you know, when I'm, when I'm with, with just women and we're making each other laugh, we're not all trying to out-joke each other. Um, so panel shows, I think, inherently are quite, how they're structured, they, they were made for men. And yes, more women are on there, but I feel it is very much women coming into men's space and trying to make it work for them rather than the other way around. But that's interesting that you actually are prepared to say you know, women together being funny is different. Yes, yeah. Well, I just, the funniest people I know are women, and that's always been the case. I've always felt that to be the case. My two best friends at school uh, were so funny, and they weren't necessarily funny um, in, in class because they didn't feel sort of comfortable in that structure. Women are a lot more um, emotionally literate, and 
there's a lot of humour to be mined there. If you're, if you're not afraid to really say how you, I don't know, how you feel about something or when you felt particularly humiliated, then I think there is, in, in a way, that it, it's harder for men to do because in society it's harder for men to talk about, talk about their feelings or be vulnerable in certain ways. I mean, if you're caricaturing it, is, is it that men are more likely to laugh at other people? No, I think it's more that there's just... Um, women can really go into the emotional depths quite quickly in a way uh, men find more tricky. So in terms of the structures in comedy, yes. are the gatekeepers men? Yes, I think, I think there are. I think we're in, what's quite weird is we're in a weird transitional stage where there is an excitement about the fact that women are funny now. There's an excitement where everyone's going, hey, women are funny. Let's, let's put them on this tea. Whoa, flea bag. And there's this, so this on, on the one hand, you've got uh, an explosion of female talent, but also sometimes I, I wonder, it, it, it's, ir it's irritating. It's irritating as women, because really you shouldn't be looking at whether, let, let's put the funny women here and the funny men here. It should really just be going, oh, this is, this is a funny person. And it's still very much, if you've got a female-led programme, it's very much, that becomes a focus. And there's a reason why, People every time um, since Fleabag, a program will come out with starring a woman, written by women. They'll go, it's the new Fleabag. So there is, it's still, it's still too much. It's still quite self-conscious, I think, in the way it's dealt with. And hopefully that'll just change over time. If you could change the world in any way, how would you change it? More comedians and less oligarchs in the House of Lords. Uh, no, I think, I think it would be if people could listen to each other better without without reaching for words like snowflakes or wokies or i mean you know the, the 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 left do it to the right as well i think we've really lost the ability to listen to the other side uh and that's that's got a lot more extreme so i think people should listen to each other more that's what i'd say that's what i'd change i don't know how you change that rosie Holt, thank you very much thank you. you very much you can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Our producer is Iman Robertson. Until next time, bye-bye.